Hello folks, thank you so much for joining us. It's, uh, it's a half full room, so we're always a little disappointed when that happens, right? But it did kind of happen. Uh, we, we turned on a dime, if you will, and uh, made this happen. As we were driving over here, uh, Mr. Baca was saying, uh, it's amazing that you were able to pull this off at such short notice. But uh, the fact is that uh, whenever we, we draw Mr. Baca's name, people seem to want to stop do what they're doing and say, we want to help. So we're, we're grateful that you're all here. Uh, this film, I, I managed uh, to in some way sneak myself into being one of the, the uh, I guess, low on the totem pole producers on, on making this film happen. And it was through some of the, the social media uh, that we were able to do that. This, this film was put together primarily by, by uh, Jimmy Sun, Sons, I should say. And, uh, and it was something that, that, that those of you that have heard Jimmy speak before understand that this is a, an amazing life story and narrative that not only inspires those of us that, that love the, 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 the written and spoken word, but also those of us that know that there's, there's a, that, uh, that flame inside all these kids, that spark that really we just need to activate. And this is uh, those literacy programs that are going to continue to, to raise the academic and achievement levels of our students, especially those of our students that are, that are low SES or considered quote unquote a minority. I think given in any opportunity, all of our, all, all of our kids, regardless of their, their socioeconomic status, are at risk youth because as we move more and more into, into these, this uh, technology-based society, we're losing the love for the written word. And uh, so this is an opportunity for us to get that, get these kids, especially some of those kids, inspired. So having met Jimmy uh, a little over a decade ago, uh, I was inspired by uh, some of the stuff that he was doing. I was a, a young uh, graduate student, actually an undergrad, uh, teaching at a charter school as a teaching assistant. I was teaching Chicano Studies. And having met him and having had the opportunity to, to, uh, to serve under his tutelage and learn so much from him, uh, I'm, I'm always honored to, to be in his presence uh, and I'm always honored uh, that uh, it, it his ability to uh, distance himself from social uh, conformity and speak his mind. And that's uh, a lot of the reason why uh, many of you are probably here to listen to what he has to say today. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm here off on a day off making sure that we're, uh, we're, we're, we're getting him all over the place. We just left uh, a charter school here in town, in Michikayo, where it's a dual language school, and he spoke to a group of kids, uh, about five-year-olds, I'm sorry, fifth graders, fourth and fifth graders, and the, the most amazing thing that he did, in, in, in my opinion, my humble opinion, was he was pretending to be the, the guy uh, that Johnny Carson used to impersonate, the guy with the hat, what was his name, those of you that are there? Yeah, there you go. And uh, he was telling he was telling them that as a poet, he's able to, to, to tell their futures. So he went to every one of the kids in the room and told them what they were going to be. And the last young person, the very special young person that he picked, he said, you're going to be a poet. And the intensity uh, in this child's eyes that all of a sudden her path was set was, was pretty amazing. So with that, uh, I, I want to introduce, not Jimmy just yet, but I want to introduce someone who, when I called, dropped everything he was doing, and he said, I want to help. And that is how you're going to do it with the Computer Center. Thank you. Thank you, Tam, and uh, thank you everybody for being here today. In fact, it was last minute, and I'm sure sometimes you hear about it. How come we don't know that we have such a prestigious writer on campus in Tucson? Now you do, many times, right? <laughs> so, again, who's dropping what? But we're delighted to, to have this opportunity to, to bring uh, Jimmy to campus. And um, I have to say that one of my favorite poems of his is As Life Was Five, which is an amazing uh, story of uh, looking back. Uh, and the other thing I need to say is that uh, um, he uh, just shared with me that he's number one in the United States right now for book sales. And that last month, uh, his last book was nominated, nominated with the Pulitzer Prize. So there are a number of accomplishments that Jimmy has been earning in, in, in over time. And for those of you that might not know, he was born in Mexico, of uh, Indian Mexican descent, and raised first by his grandmother, later sent to an orphanage. A runaway at age 13, he was back up, um, he was then when he was uh, sentenced to five years in a maximum 
reason that he began to turn his life around. He learned to read and write in an voracious passion for poetry. During a fatal conflict with another inmate, Jimmy was shaken by the voices of Neruda and Lorca and made a choice that would alter his destiny. Instead of becoming a hardened criminal, he emerged from prison a writer. Back a century of his poems to Dennis Levertov, the poetry editor of Bob Jones. The poems were published and became part of Immigrants in Our Own Land, published in 1979, the year he was released from prison. He ended his GED later that same year, is the winner of the Pusher Prize, the American Book Award, the International Hispanic Heritage Award for his memoir, Place to Stand, in honor of my fair books, the prestigious International Award. Um, and in 2006, he won the Cornelius D. Turner Award. The National Award recognizes one GD graduate a year who has made outstanding contributions to society, and education, justice, health, public service, and social welfare. Baca had devoted his post-prison life to writing and teaching others who are overcoming hardship. His themes include American South of Barrios, addictions, injustice, education, community, love, and beyond. He has conducted hundreds of writing workshops in prisons, community centers, libraries, and universities throughout the country. In 2005, he created Cedar Tree Inc., a nonprofit foundation that works to give people of all walks of life the opportunity to become educated and improve their lives. Uh, I have to say that we won't be able to watch the entire film, but we're just gonna give you an advance of the film. And this is due to a number of reasons that Jimmy might share with you. But with that, please help me welcome Jimmy Santiago Bach. Education, but not the kind of bullshit they teach you now, right? 
it's totally factory, factory, mechanical, go to the corporation, fuck your friend, go have an education. But I said, you can drop out of, you can drop out of this room, get your GED, but do something. Because he was brilliant. So he passed the test, took his GED, passed the guy, got, he got out. And then he went to bed. And he went to bed for the next month and the next month and the next. He was in bed. And then at night he'd get up and smoke a bunch of weed, you know, and this and that. And I'd be like, what have I done as a parent? I have five kids, right? One of them is an amazing young woman at Juilliard. I have Lucia and Eastside who are beyond genius. Eastside broke all the school records and doesn't even study, right? Probably do this with mother's brilliance. But Gabe, I told this kid, Daniel, if you can get my son out of bed, I'll, get, I'll let you do it. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know what? If you got out of bed, that would be a trial. But these kids don't understand that it takes at least a quarter million dollars to even turn the ignition switch on a movie production company, right? They don't understand that, right? Jesus Christ. Yeah, they were like, and so by the way, I said, can I borrow your credit card? I said, sure. Why not? I let kids be kids, right? I took my older kids to Vegas to all the strips when he was 11 years old. He got it. He became a great accountant, you know? I said, why not the game? He's better guard travel. So he took it, they took off, and they went to interview everybody that had been in prison with me. At least they said they were going to, right? So they ended up at Benjamin Bratt's house and Alan Marin's place and all these famous movie stars that I had worked with and been in the movies with. Me. And, uh, and then I said, well, where? And I looked at the credit card statement, and they weren't using the credit card. I said, where the hell, where are they getting all this money from? So I didn't know where they were getting the money, so my son says, Pops, look at Kickstarter. You ever heard of think of Kickstarter, right? I never heard of it. 225000 freaking dollars. And if I'd have known that, I'd have been on that damn thing to pay my bills for like 20 years ago. I mean, if I knew that many people knew me, I'd say, can you send me money so I can pay my gas bill this month? And it was 11,000 people that knew me. Knew my work, I was like, wow. And what Javier met a while ago was, uh, it was fabulous because I got a call, I got a call from the publisher saying that last week I sold, I, I broke the record, I sold over $30,000 in one month of people walking in the stores, can you dig it? And this ain't bullshit that you end up on the Tavis Smiley or Gopher's or whatever the hell you're going to go on. I don't have a TV, I don't watch TV. This is people like you walking in and buying books of mine. Who would have the next comic coming out of here? You would actually do that. When you guys were trying to find me on the wanted poster in the post offices, that's what you were looking for. I was the last guy to have a wanted poster. I told my kids, be proud of me, come on. <laughs> I mean, that's something that's a claim to me. How many guys you know have had your wanted? Look at that. And then I thought, well, maybe I should do something about that, you know? Maybe I should have, right? That's what you know what I'm saying? I wish I'd have taken it though, right? Because it would have been such a cool thing to have a wonder poster. And they never caught me. That was cool. <laughs> okay, I turned myself in. But uh, they raised all this money. They did, the, they did the film. They were geniuses at it. Um, they, had a, they had a showing, sold out. They, had a, they were probably called the fundraisers at screening. And then all the screenings sold out, and word of mouth went, and they sold all those out. So they extended the screenings so they could make a ton more money uh, until uh, March. They're opening up in 500 theaters in, in this country. These are two kids from college. They were blue. They were so big. I'm going to make you feel like I'm to You know, I kind of wait to say, you get my kid out of bed. My kid got out of bed, right? And now he has his own film company. He's working on his third feature. I'm like, the, the dude with the... The kid with the tattoo, that's my son. That's the guy that's out there doing that? It's 8 o'clock, he's out of bed. They're like, hey, and the guy's running his own production company. I'm like, wow. Okay, let me just read you one quick thing. This film is about when I was at Florence, and I was I was a bad little MF, mother you know what? Because I refused to do anything the word said. I just, I was just a bad, bad MF. I did not want to do what anybody said, and I, uh, I just didn't. They, they wouldn't let me out to attend the writing workshop. They wouldn't let me out to do shit. And I was okay with it. Because um, I just wasn't going to go along with the program. I just knew it was wrong. But I didn't think I was going to be a writer. I just didn't want to go along with the program. I said, 
this ain't right for you to very much. I was awaiting extradition in the Albuquerque County Jail for a deal that went sour in Arizona where the DPA did not. Okay, I'm going to read you a couple of pages and that's it. From the, from the successor to uh, a place to stand, I'm very fortunate to have as a, as a bestseller globally. I love it because it's paid the bills for all five kids. They paid the bills for all five kids. Paid my daughter's school in Juilliard. Paid my son, my other son's uh, uh, school. And uh, it's done great, and I love it for that purpose alone. But I'm not one of those guys, I like to switch up. I'm not one of those guys who just keeps on writing the same car over and over. I like to do different things. So this is gonna, this is the, this is the new book. This is the new book. Uh, it's a successor to a place to stack, okay? Oops. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, I wanted to see what the guy did when he came out of prison. Because this was, this was all about how, what happened when he went in prison. This is how it starts out, first couple of pages, okay? And I had to, I had to, uh, I had to fictionalize it or quote fictionalize it because there's Michael Jordan's in it, Senator Jesse Holmes from North Carolina is in it. Some of the wealthiest families in America are in it. So, so not to get sued and to make sure that it could get published, I had to fictionalize the names. Anyway, Michael Jordan used to sell him kilos of coke. And Jesse Helms was involved with amazing uh, uh, black market uh, uh, international arms trade. He was, he was buying more weapons from Cuba at the same time putting up the blockade. Can you believe it? Yes. That was Jesse Helms? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. The first few pages, and that's it, are the first people in America to hear it. I should be charging you, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you one thing. Look, I, I don't know why. I know I know why. I, I, I flew in last night. I flew in yesterday. And I was so exhausted. I, I slept 14 hours straight. And that's not like me. I maybe need three hours every 24 hours. And I could go on and on. With, you know, so with this, with this movie thing to help these kids out, I did all the major cities in Canada. I did all the major cities in Central America and South America. So. Here in the country, I mean everywhere. Next week we have we have fifteen thousand teachers coming to see it at the Gaylord Hotel in DC. Do you believe that shit? I'm freaking with you. Anyway, so listen. Here's the here's the end. Here's the end of that. So it was very cool. I was laying in bed in Santa Fe two nights ago, and for some reason, Kenny, I don't know why, just bothered it bothered the hell out of me. I was like, why, why is he calling me with ASAP? It's my only night I get to sleep. But it bothered the hell out of me. So I called him and I said, okay, what the? Hold on a second. And I looked at the poster. Holy shit, I'm supposed to be there tomorrow morning at 8? <laughs> what? I thought this was like four months in the, in the future. And then I yelled out, guys, I'm supposed to be at Tucson tomorrow morning. And my daughter's like, yee go to school, let's go. <laughs> She's only nine, right? I was like, go to see the universe, then we get along. The hell with that, Bobby. We're going to drive it now. We're with you. I said, I'm with you. Be with me. I'm with you. Shut up. <laughs> I said, okay. So my son jumps up and says, yeah, let's go rent us a car. And I'm like, no, 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 no. So we all got in the car. We're going to come to Tucson at 10 o'clock at night to be here the following morning at 8. Is that, I mean, that's what drug dealers do and shit, right? <laughs> that's not what responsible fathers do with their families, right? <laughs> but everybody was like, you know, all well, was like, yeah, baby, just like the old days. And I'm like, no, this is not like the old days. I haven't slipped since the old days. And uh, so we get in the car, and I, I managed to tell the kids, look, let's go by the hotel, La Fonda, the famous one, right? In Santa Fe, on the plaza, and let's have us some fried ice cream. And let's talk. So by the time we finished the fight, I said, they're all tired. And they said, oh, we don't want to go. We don't want to go So I said, cool. So we all go back home. And that's when I called the airlines and said, because we got a 6 o'clock flight. And they said, yeah. And I got here. And don't ask me. I mean, I swear to God, it was by the grace of God that I looked at that post and I said, what do you say? My God, are you kidding me? <laughs> so here, this is written by that frame of mind. At 28, it's called American Orphan. At 28, late August of 78, I was released from Youngsville Prison in Colorado. Completing six years for selling heroin, 
aggravated by a shootout with a DEA. I ended up doing hard time behind the walls. One never knows what to expect from walking through the main gates, but the moment my foot fell on freedom ground, I had trouble walking. I had the feeling I was falling and felt like I had just landed on a new planet with no gravity. Awkward as an astronaut bouncing in space, the immensity of the sky and earth rose up before me, and it was hard to breathe for a second. My breathing labored as if my lungs had just been torn from my chest. I drifted in so much freedom it scared the hell out of me. On the way out, I dropped my box of notebooks off to go to my sister's. I picked up my airline tickets to New Mexico on a hundred bucks. Yeah, as much as I would like to imbue my imprisonment with a cavalier claim that it was filled with the adventure of a Bond film, it was anything but. Unlike the people in those fucking prison movies that glamorize it, truth was I was a stupid 22-year-old kid who just got busted. Bond sued a million bucks, and me with eight cents in my pocket and a court-appointed lawyer. Fuck the adventure. My body was accustomed to a 9 by 12 world and freedom was so large and endless, it dwarfed me to the speck. And staring at the stars just for a moment, I ceased to exist. I survived the nightmare and that was enough. I found myself floating in an aimless pause, this massive limbo between the end of a criminal sentence and the beginning of a new life. And I felt as this insubstantial as vapor willowing out of the roof pipes. So much space in me, so inconsequential. I needed words to name this unknown world. I knew that if I couldn't find the words to place myself in it, I'd be as lost as a wandering, tortured soul in the wasteland, in Dante's wasteland. No rash decisions, I thought. Definitely no more dealing drugs. I was a different man, moving lightly on my feet, looking at Earth from a whole different perspective. The dirt, the weeds, the trees, they were so close and weighted and made me feel alive and vital, and I greeted them with a slight nod as I managed to carry myself into their world, heal the toe, heal the toe, into the nothingness of a new life, into the heart, the dark heart of freedom. Yeah, I said to myself, I finished my time. And yes, there was a sadness of leaving so many friends behind. It was like the sadness was the temperature of my skin, and I shivered with an inner chill and be so alone with no allies to watch my back. I felt naked and vulnerable out here. And between the gate and the van, my life seemed to tear from its familiar ruins, and the state correction paperwork that condemned me as a criminal scattered like morning doves in the dawn. And between these worlds, a whole new narrative began. I said a goodbye prayers for those friends I left behind in those prison walls. And I helped me lower prayers as I stepped toward the white van idling in the employee parking lot. And as we drove around away, I glanced behind at the prison that seemed to have a strange force calling back. But I had no regrets, no reluctance. I wasn't fucking coming back. And as we drove, that massive spaceship of steel and concrete, that hulking empire of the doom, sailed away into the dark horizon without me, collecting more debris of more broken lives. And I'll tell you, and I'll tell you loud, louder with capital letters, louder! The morning moon shone on me and murmured her affirmation, whispering, you, time traveler, you endured the dreamer's ritual and you became a spirit man. Moments like this cry out for some Herculean climax. Walls toppled, steel melted, wielding a biblical staff to command legions of lightning gods to descend from the mountaintop, but no, in a time of such fucking mediocrity, corruption, and endless wars, if a cello player were to appear and strum the sweetest dirge to commemorate this memorable crossroads with meaning and purpose, he'd probably be arrested for playing without a permit and have his cello cops. <laughs> There's nothing but the exhaust pipe sputter, wailing jennings on the van radio, a dumb guard smoking discount red cigarettes, and three other convicts trying to kill each other. One black, one white, when she got him. I smiled with the irony at our reflection in the window. No four romantic nights were we released by the king after rehab. To go forth to retrieve the grail? Nay, hey, brother and sister. Nor were our spirits lifted buoyantly in awe of this wonderfully enchanted morning. 
we were criminalized into fucking killers who had our souls maimed and barbed wire with seething teeth to avenge our suffering of the innocent. It was business as usual happening 20,000 times all over America. Every single hour with men like us who have been broken and tortured into avenging brutes. And we would kill all of you, white, black, brown. We who had waited a long time to purge our vengeance on society for the torture and the upon them. And these three with me, having lived side by side for decades with nothing to spent each day imagining ways to kill each other if given a chance. And well, as you know, sometimes that nasty joker in the deck shows up when you're holding the best of hands. And with each mile we drove, they started swearing how they dismembered the other two once we arrived at the terminal. It could have been 30 minutes or it could have been three hours. I don't know. I was looking out the window when we finally glided under the corrugated airport terminal. And the guy said, all right, bitches, here's where your daddy leaves his girls. And he swung to the curb and pulled out as quickly, leaving us there like four confused ducks at a busy intersection of the Times Square. We stood at his ice until the Chicano said, I need a drink before I kill you ugly fucks. The skinhead and the black followed, and I took up the rear until the upper thinking, just when water rises to the chin, there's always a straw. All three sat at the bar. I took an end and ordered water. The skinhead snowed, motherfucker and ordered Jack and Coke, the Chicano tequila and the black vodka. They stared in the mirror and the Chicano said finally, we next to each other for 27 years in that fucking dungeon and all released at the same time? And you right about that, motherfucker. He downed his shot and ordered the double. Yep. Class action suit, a cruel and unusual punishment to the skinhead, licked his lips here, here and drained his glass. I'll take it any way they give it to me, the black brother gazed at his face in the mirror feeling pleased with it, and raised his glass for another. Why'd you want to kill each other, I asked, thinking it was some kind of unresolved gang shit. You a fucking counselor? The brother in tone? Just curious, I replied and added, I'd be making mad money with you crazy motherfuckers if I was your counselor. <laughs> it's that place, in there. I had a million reasons out here I can't find one skin head on. Toast, I said, raising my glass of water to a kill and a bird. I wouldn't speak so soon that you're gonna grin. <laughs> hey, hey, the other two chimed in. They smiled and ordered more drinks and continued sitting there staring at the mirror, wondering with their eyes, what the fuck happened to them over the years? Trying to measure the damage, the incalculable loss of what could have been and it was. They were getting drunk and I said goodbye. And they wanted to give me their address and they wrote it down on that camera. One guy rode down a pool hall, another one far in the skin and asked me to ride him a bomb in that organ. I felt bad for us kind of people. I was in the same sorry condition, no home address, but I was heading to New Mexico to jumpstart my life again. And my life at the moment was one of those abandoned cars that you see when you're driving, in the farm, fields, kids use for target practice, and it was time to put the pieces together again and see if I couldn't get myself moving. When I arrived at the Albuquerque International Airport, I took a bus to the Mesa, explained to myself as I got out, God damn, I need to run. And the bus driver shrugged and nodded his head as if saying, get your ass back to the side and get back on your meds. You a lost cause, sucker. But for me, restraining my bars and walls and guards, freedom manifested itself in my love of running. I ran to meditate to alleviate my heart, dicks, needing some fucking pussy, to relieve my boredom and frustration and sometimes just plain old terror. I used to lap the field 40, 50, 60 times until I was so tired I dropped. I must have run a thousand miles in that prison. And now boredom was the last thing on my mind. In some bizarre balance of the desert, scrub brush clawed my pants legs, jackrabbits darted across our royals, the sun burled with gold and in black robes and scarves across the air in a dervish dance, sketching a beautiful portrait of love on the horizon. And I loved my sweat and my t-shirts clinging to my chest and the aches in my knees and the sharp pins of pain stabbing my ankles. It felt so good to be alive with lungs burning. And instead of big cathedral bells shuddering the air with tribunal tyranny, my labor breath made small handheld bells jingle in my heart and this private Christmas for a free criminal. It'd been a long time since I ran like this. I saw the dormant volcanoes in the distance and I decided that I was going to stop reading now. <laughs> yeah, nice. uh, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Uh, 
I want. That's called American Orphan. And it's a beautiful book about how, what happens when a convict leaves prison. And, uh, and it's an ex extraordinary thing because he's in touch with Norm him, him and Norman Mailer, Grace Bailey, Audrey and Rich, Denise Hartoff. They're all in his life. But there's also a bunch of gangsters in his life too. All coming in to try to help him. So he has to decide which way to go. And it's a beautiful book. And I'm probably the only guy in history, the only guy, that got a six-figure advance on it and fired my eighth brigade. Talk about work. Because it wasn't ready to publish. You know, even though she said, oh, they're going to publish it, they're going to give you 150 up front, wasn't ready to publish. And I knew it when I saw it in the cabin. I had this gorgeous ranch in front of the Santa Fe. And I kept pacing the table in the mornings when I went out to chop wood and grab the horses and do all this shit, run the water down from the other side of the springs. I saw it on the table, and after about the second week, I said, not ready to take a video. So the eighth rewrite, I called her up, I fired her. She told me, oh, fuck yourself. You know, because when I do fire as an agent, for getting me that much money, right? I understood. And the coach was like, well, we, we love it. Yeah, we go for it. So what he just heard was the book hiding beneath the book. I know that's hard for me to tell young writers to hold your book until it gels and ferments. And, you know, it's not the first season. It's not the first cutting or the second cutting. It's the third cutting you know, to get the good stuff. I could be. And I'm, I'm an old time girl. I'm kidding. Now we're going out to the imagination again, right? Anyway, you got uh, 15, 20 minutes of watching this, okay? 15 minutes, and this is, this is the guy in prison, and I know you're going to want to watch it all. Your audience is all over town in America. Like I said, they extended it three months, the fundraising aspect, because it's so, so many audiences are coming out. Anyway, so come on up, Kevin. I just want to say, this is a lifesaver. Thank you for it. Being able to come here and relax for a couple, three days, oh my God. I was up this morning at the four o'clock, walking the hills. The same, like not very far away from the prison, right? Do you know how good that feels? To have five kids that are amazingly beautiful and successful and spirit-wise, have been blessed to the highest loving awareness you can expect of any, of any dharma of God. And to have a beautiful home and beautiful ranch and beautiful life. Dude! And I took my pants off and went out toward the prison and took the shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, like I said, he doesn't submit to the conformities that uh, some, some writers do, right? And, uh, oh, I forgot. Can we tell them they, they got to buy the books because yeah, the so wheel broke. I, I brought books, and they're, they're rare books, and you wouldn't get them anywhere else. And the covers, but the, the tire on the, on the, on the thing broke. I'm trying to convince him to write a book about the adventure of uh, coming here. Uh, we, I uh, get to TIA, TIA to pick him up at the airport at 9 a.m. and, and uh, I see him coming down uh, the, the escalator on the big screen there. And uh, this is after waiting about 20 minutes because the power went down at TIA. So everything was shut down. They actually had to tow the plane in because there's some sort of guidance system on the plane to come into the... Into the uh, the gate there, and uh, so he, he rolls up and he goes, "Let's go get, let's go get the luggage." So he's he's dragging two bags, and one of them is just kind of doing the squeaking sound. And uh, when, when we arrived here at the parking structure, there, there was we see tires. So he said, "You guys got to buy every book that's on the table because we're just going to toss the suitcase uh, in, in the trash." So uh, please, we we have a few books. We'll, we'll have to take a look at them. Yeah, one thing really quick. I went by a friend of mine, his Irish poet's house, and I said, uh, I'm going to drop you a couple of boxes of books, save them for me, and they were first editions, right? And I took off. I said, I'll be back tomorrow. I didn't come back for 15 years. <laughs> and I saw him, right? And he said, I got the boxes of <laughs> And I said, dude, you got what? He said, and I looked, and they were first edition. They're going for $1,100 on eBay now, right? And I didn't say anything to him. I said, oh, dude, oh, God, I don't want these books. And I played it out, like, I'll take them, come on. Yeah. So I took them out there. If he would have known that they were first edition collector's books, he 
wouldn't have given me nothing. <laughs> and he was, he didn't know, he's like, take these damn books. And what about me out of here? No, <laughs> is that God or what? First edition is hardcover. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's what I got there. Some of you guys take advantage. And the first from edition is about place to stand. Uh, so with that, we're going to introduce this, 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 these first 30 minutes of the film. Uh, and then we'll be back for a few minutes. Way. 
you were no longer going to participate in that reality. This one was a holy war. And it was called hell. In the 70s, it was a pretty, pretty rugged place to be. There were a lot of killings going on, uh, gangs were forming. A lot of inmate on inmate violence. Um, there was guard on inmate violence. It was nothing, nothing at all youth to be stabbing with blood when you walk down the steps. You were really dealing with death every day. Stuff, got my own organs, got my blues, got my stuff, got mine, went to see me one back in office, as they call it, walked in. 500 men screaming and yelling, carrying on. And they're whistling at you and they're going, Woo, what's up? Look at that. Look at that leg. Look at that ass. That was mine. Give me a kiss, baby. Give me a kiss. And when I walked in that diagnostic center, there was a big black guy in the corner with a drum, and he looked at me with that leer. That he was going to rape me. And I looked at him and said, All right, we have business. I went up to myself, and thank God I had a harmonica in my pocket. I was very good at harmonica. And uh, my fellow wanted to use it to so she couldn't pay. I didn't know. We weren't friends or anything, but he said, Can I buy your harmonica? And I said, Yeah. So I gave it to him, and he tore it apart, and he cooked his heroin on one of those plates, the exterior plates. Shot up, came back my harmonica, and he said, It was like a bonding. And then I told him, Hey, there's this guy, man, that, you know, when I walked in and stuff. And he said, I don't know, but what's going on? You know, and he said, He called one of his friends over. They came over, they passed him the shank, he gave it to me. He said, Here, man, take him out in the morning. And I said to him, Well, can I just fire him with my fist? No, you got to step him. I said, You mean like, and he said, Yeah, come on, take him out. I said, Got you? If you show weakness in the system, uh, prison system, uh, there will always be somebody, and the word gets around if that person is uh, weak. And if that person is weak, they will always try to take advantage. Basically, prison, you're really on your own. And the environment is encouraging you to become more angry, more bitter, more violent. Your only choice is 100% defending yourself uh, or giving up. 100% of yourself. There's no middle ground. You either protect yourself however you can, or you're done. I went out to the field the next morning. It was the field. And they were stopping everybody at the gate, and uh, they had the wand, they were wanting us. And I happened to take turn left, and I saw them under the woodshop. And I just broke mine. Just ran at him. I didn't even have the sense to pull a shank cut. I just ran at him. <laughs> Boom! He had his head down like this, and he was doing something in a grinder, and I put his face in the grinder, and it cut right through his eye and his skull. Cut right through it. And I had him on the ground, and bam, with the bedpost, there was a big can full of bedposts. Wham! Wham! And all the guards came, and about 10 of them just beat this, they beat you up pretty bad. And as they were pulling me away, I looked at the line, and I see my cabron, and he gave me the nod that right on the cabron and made us proud. When I got into that first fight, that wasn't me. That was something I had to do in order to remain with me. But when I actually did the act, the violent act against this man, it took away from me. I was trying to protect him. They took away from me. So the first two weeks of prison had had problems with me, and I was now becoming a desensitized human being. 
the survival sake. I was thrown in the hole for 30 days after that fight. I went up to the cell and had blood, you know, the smell of blood on me. And they hose you off with the hose. And they put you in a dark cell, you know, they just hold you up, you're supposed to run away. So I was in a dark hole with no clothes, smelling my blood. An animal had just attacked me. That's all. We didn't know if he was going to kill her, if he was going to kill us. We didn't know. 
You just didn't know what was going to happen from day to day. My mom was working at Piggly Wiggly, and there was a really nice guy there, Richard. He started flirting with her and everything, and they started going out. Then my mom decided that she was going to go with Richard and divorce my dad. Because, you know, I mean, you can't blame her. You really can't, you know, I think about it now, and I go, gosh. And I probably would have ran away too, you know, but I would have taken my kids. I don't remember the pain, but I remember being scared. I remember that for some deep archetypal sense that the soul carries in it, when your mother leaves, everything changes. Not your father. Your father can come and go. But when the mother leaves, that's when that's when the earth reverses its gravitational spin. Everything changes. And I knew when she left that the center had fallen out and the center could no longer hold us together. And I knew that we were all going to be scattered out. I knew something terrible was about to happen. My aunt, Cecilia, came to my grandmother's and dropped the kids off. My mom looked at us and said, I'll be back in two weeks. I'm going on vacation. And I'll be back in two weeks to pick you guys up. Two weeks passed. Nothing. A month passed. No mom. Well, we got a box. We got this huge box delivered to us. And in the box was our clothes, toys, and our personal belongings. Your departure uprooted me, mother. Hollow core of child. Your absence whittled down to a broken doll in a barn loft. The small burned area of memory where your face is supposed to be. Moon's rings pass through the broken chain of events in my dreams. My heart became an arroyo, and my tears cut deep cracks in my face of sand. When my tia Jessie came to take me away from grandma, with rocks in my pockets, earth that bit off for me like soft bread for the long journey, I left Estancia for the orphanage. Losing my mother and father and everything else, just like, you know, everything so fast, you know, it was like a shock, that was a shock, and then being in the, in the orphanage was the bigger shock, and he's, like I said, a high risk taker, so he would not even think twice about just walking out of a place and not going back, right? finding a way to, to survive. He was always turning away from the orphanage, always. He didn't want to be there. Jimmy was not the type that was going to take orders from everybody or do what they wanted. And he would always tell Milo, we're going to run away. And Milo would say, no, Jimmy, I don't think you're going to do that. He was, well, I'm going. You're either going to go with me or you're not. The beatings didn't do anything. And I remember the last beating. I remember that they took three nuns after they repeated running away over the years. So right away, you know, as a prologue to what's going to happen every life, I was escorted by three guards. Three months. I, I was eight years old. I'm being escorted in the whole orphanage. And I, was in that. I suddenly gained this amazing importance among all the rest of the kids in the orphanage. They were like, yeah, you did it, Maka. You did it. You got three nuns to beat you this time. And I'm like, yeah. And there was room number five where you got a spanking. Bank is a room number five for spitting or stealing or getting or buying or whatever. But the dormitory was where the torture, you know, they, they took you there. And so they took me to the dormitory and three nuns, each of them took some big, huge head smokes. And they pulled up those big pads and they used to turn. After the fourth or fifth hit, my butt went numb. So I wasn't feeling anything. They kept hitting and hitting and the other night and I turned around and looked at them they were sweating and I thought, this is ridiculous. My butt doesn't feel anything anymore, you know? <laughs> they were like, we're gonna break you, kid. 
And it was at that moment that I began to defy them. I said, oh, this is, this is home. You, you're going to beat me with boards? That's home? I could defy you. This is nothing. I'll be gone tomorrow. And I told him, brother, I'm running away tonight. You're coming with me. Let's go. And we both got ready in the dorms. Lights went off. People went to bed. I got up. I got my brother. I said, let's go. We went up the, the big doors. We pushed open the big steel door. We took off across the top. People got to the fence line. I jumped over the fence. I turned around. I looked at my brother. He looked at me. He said, I'm afraid. I can't go. And I just looked at him and said, it was lighthearted. It wasn't like real deep and grieving. I was like, later, bro. And I just took off right down the ditch. The only way that I kept my sanity in the hole was by revisiting my memories. For weeks, I relived the fable of my life, rediscovering the boy I was and the life I lived. By the time they opened the door and let me out of isolation, I was so deep into my past that I almost had forgotten I was in prison. After my initial stint in the hole, I was determined to try to be better. But I realized after I got out, it was just new friends. I had to fight the guy's friends and his friends and his friends. You don't just fight and it's over. You come out of the hole and you got all these new enemies you've got to deal with. I am standing in front of a brute who wants to off my friend. And I'm very scared inside. But I saddle up next to my friend clench my fist and I'm ready for the fight. Sometimes I am in the midst of bullies who want this or that from me, so several times I had to defend myself, knife someone or beat them with my fists. So here I am, pondering the clash of violence Oppression, the killing of souls, the stale smell in the air that jolts the heart like big rifles as the bullets of violence and frustration kill the souls, kill creativity, kill God's creation. Those white doves root up red roses, leaving empty eyes in the rootless lives of men. Because he never had it. I started selling drugs when I was about 17. 
And it wasn't selling drugs to make money, it was selling drugs so you could have your own stash to party with each night. But when I left Albuquerque, I went to New Arizona, and in Yuma, I met all these guys along the border in Mexico that sold quantities of marijuana. So I would, I would take up to 200 to 500 pounds at a time. And then I got caught.
that I assumed that I was a coward. Because I, I was trying to protect my life. I don't even know why I wanted to finish the story. It just came up to me like an apparition in the dark. The wicked ghost told me, follow me. And I did. I don't know where it was going, I don't know what it meant. It just, it was the only thing that made sense to me. The fights didn't make sense. The jail didn't mean anything. Any way I could get back to my grandfather, I was going to go, this was it. I wanted to go back to a time that made sense where I was loved. I wanted to go back to a place that was peaceful. And this was it. Everything else was chaos and violence. And this little tiny stupid baby, these little stupid words, were offering me a way out of the chaos. There have been experiments in the United States with trying to create prisons to wholesomely transform the individuals who come into them so that they'll leave the other side better people than when they went in. That was the founding promise of the reformatory penitentiary in the Northeast. That was not ever really a promise ever tried very vigorously in Arizona. Arizona's always been a punishment state. It was, you know, with get bad guys, there was a real sense of less of eligibility. They shouldn't be pleasant places. They should make people suffer so that they don't want to come back. It was just a prison. It was lock them up and control the violence. And I don't mean control the violence in the sense of stopping it. I mean keep it confined within the walls. It was not built with rehabilitation in mind. So to, to get education, to, to participate in the program, all of these things were, were luxuries for very, very few. After I got out of the hole, I went to the reclass committee, and they said, look, if you don't get in trouble anymore, Jimmy, if you do 90 days, three months working in the kitchen, you can go to school. And I said to them, that's all I wanted from the beginning, it was about to be allowed to go to school. You got it. Three months passed, I didn't so much as look at another comment. All I did was serve oatmeal and sweep the kitchen floor. I go back to reclass. They tell me, you're not going to school. You're going to be to work. I looked at the counselor because the counselor came up to my soul several times and said, you're doing great, you're being school very soon. I looked at him and I said, what is, what's going on here? And then the counselor said to me, what do you think this is, a freaking uh, college? You get your ass from doing work like that. What? And all of a sudden, Captain Nanny flipped off the recorder. I looked at Captain Nanny. Captain Nanny said to me, one last time, 32, 581, you could not leave. And he glanced at 500, this huge guard was made job of breaking. Five minutes got up from the, from the committee, and I told myself, get up there, you gotta go now. <laughs> get up, you gotta go now. And the first thing I did, it scared me a little bit, I told him, my body would not obey my mind. And then the next thing I knew, I was I was early in the air. I'd been kicked by 500, and I'd just been hit, and I got this blacked out. I got to my cell, I had no interest in going to the dining hall to eat. I wasn't hungry, and there was no plans to do this or that. I just wasn't hungry. I just wanted to be out tomorrow. When I didn't go to dinner that, that evening, <clears throat> I didn't get a ride up for the second one. I right? when everybody broke out of the child. I said, I'm not going to go to breakfast. That's the first ride up that came. And I didn't know you could get a ride up for, for not going, but I didn't go to lunch, another ride up, dinner, another, another, another ride up. But before I knew it, I was doing the passive Gandhi estate. I was sitting there doing nothing, and I had the warden calling me up, I had guards coming, I had the convicts coming up, what well, I get that myself no. The guards, who the hell do you think you are? The warden, I'll break your ass before you think you're running anything. I'm like, dude, I haven't done anything, and I've got everybody going crazy. <laughs> that evening, I, I heard that real familiar sound. <laughs> It was the Goon Squad. Shields, helmets, batons. Boom, boom, up the staircase. Bam, bam, really shaking. 
everybody locked down. The whole cell block went locked down. So people said, like, well, who were they going to? They were going to my cell. Mad Dog Patrol was in the, was in the lead. He was the worst, most black guard I ever met. And he yelled out, Rat Baca. Racked it, and I said, get out. I had my boxer shorts on, I came out, and I stood out the two like that, and there was five hundred right behind me. Mad Dog and Joe looked at the other goose squad and said, shake it. They, got, they ran to my shoulder, started lifting the mattresses apart and tearing everything up, you know? And just then, BAM! Five hundred hit me with his, with his club on the side of my ribs, and I said, downstairs, bitch. I went downstairs to the landing, and I had handcuffs on like this, and I was sort of looking around, and I saw the entire cell block going crazy. Everybody was shaking bars, their faces were up against them, you know? That you could feel from the rage of their voices, the very complicated steel shake. I could feel it in my feet, I was barefoot. I'll never forget when I walked out of that cell block to the outside, and it was nighttime. I'll never forget when I looked up at the night stars, I knew that I had done something I always wanted to do. You can call it freedom. You can call it uh, 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 lust like God. You can call it bravery. I don't know what you call it when you sense in the deepest, deepest core of your soul that what you've just done is going to change your life forever. And I suddenly I walked with stronger footing underneath me. When I walked across the yard, I wasn't a scared anymore. I wasn't Jimmy the convict anymore. I wasn't a 21 year old chicken anymore. I was somebody in the universe who mattered. It seems prison confines and destroys. It does. I know. No need to argue the point. Just look at these infamous edifices thrashing out, consuming human beings like bait sardines. But I cannot stand on this. Yes, the great hand of prison crushes all in its grasp. The mind and soul become feeble sacks filled with rotten fruits. A gunny sack crumpled in a dark cell. But to control your mind and soul is to become stronger in it, embanking gently the loose clods of a ravaged and confused past. So the river of your heart and the clear streams of your soul may pass, full and free, into rich, fallow beds of freedom waiting for you, even in prison, even in prison. Many will not understand this, but I will say that we can and we must overcome. Not today, tomorrow, or next month, but at the very moment that one decides upon. They put me in a book that you had to put down because you had to go to sleep and you got the flashlight going but uh, that's where we're going to stop and we're going to bring Mr. Mr. Baca back for a Q&A. Which is sound to me too because of the grass. Oh my 
in the right of ways in the environmental. We have an ex-convict program. We have an organic farm, and and uh, we hire ex-convicts and we teach them how to write up on the environment. And ex-convicts, I know people who have saved species from extinction. I know people who went down to Oaxaca and saved the jaguar. And yet, I have to say, with very, very little bias, that these ex-convicts that I hire have become have become more conscientious stewards of the land than anyone I've ever known. They treat the seeds like their own souls. And when they when they harvest apples or garlic or onions or green chili, they, they do it with such reverence. And they have such respect. We're opening up the Fain Santa Fe. And we have a, uh, we're going to feed the homeless and the mentally ill from 6 to 8.30 for free. And then from 9 o'clock, we're going to charge the hell out of white people at that point. We're going to pay for all the overhead. I'm kidding you. That's good you could not. Thank you. Because every time white people say jokes about Chicanos, everybody, ah! Yeah. Then when you throw a joke against us, a white person, they're like, ooh? They <laughs> laugh. It's okay. Life is too short. Okay? Life is much too short to worry about stuff like that. Uh, uh, and any questions? Anybody have questions? Yes. You said in the film after you hurt that man who wanted to rape you that you lost something of yourself. Yeah. I'm wondering, can you get that back? Oh yeah, I got it back. Mm -hmm. Got it big time. That's my wife. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I look at it, I'm in a very funny mood today. I don't know what it is. <laughs> People call it forgotten medication. Bipolar, whatever. I don't know what it is. All, all I know, all I know, is that it's so good to be here with you all in this room, and not be sitting in front of five thousand people having to play like I'm serious. This is a, what happened with the black guy wanting to rape me. It happens to everybody in this country today. It happened to about three million people today, and about a hundred thousand kids got raped today. And when you, and when I, what I did was I wonder now. Why didn't I just let him fuck me? Why? Why was I willing to kill that man? Let me tell you an experiment I did. It, it, it did, because it, the more I turned to violence, the more I became with the prison one we had. I was, I, we, had a, we had a program in Alameda County in, in Oakland, San Francisco area. And I, I went in there, and it had been a long standing program. We had brought in all kind of people, uh, all writers from the Bay Area, you know, the uh, Alice Walkers and all of those. Uh, Alice Walker didn't do too good, but uh, we would pay them. So we had a little thing going on. We, had, we would pay them a hundred bucks. I would pay them a hundred bucks if they could write a response to a book. And I knew that it would be a long time before I paid anybody because none of them could read and write. But that hundred bucks to them was like, yeah. So I told them, I want you to do me a favor. Let's, let's, analyze, let's analyze this thing called love. And it was sad because when I went in, all the blacks were there, all the, the Asians were there, very few whites, but they had a whole group of whites and the Chicanos over there and the Indians, a lot of them. And these were the best of our society. We're not the best. We compromise our ass on everything. It's those kids who are like, you're my friend and I will die for you. Even if it's over a paper or crack or cocaine. I mean, how many people do you know right now that stand up for you to die for you? Those kids all did it. They had this thing called the warrior code. And they were all going to prison for 60 years. And you looked in their eyes and they were 18 and 19 and 20 and they were beautiful. Their spirits were beautiful and pure. And they were, wow, they were just, they were lost in this prehistoric archetypal code of the union type. They would give their life for you because they, you were their brother. And I felt so sad for them. That the best of our youth, not the ones, they're the best. They have their bodies, their minds, their hearts were beautiful. And we were dumping them because we, we fear them. We fear them all. Unless we can take them like a six foot six basketball player and socialize them and say, you want to perform for us, we'll pay tickets, and it's all built into a system. You can't take a beautiful wild kid off the open streets and say, you know, you're a warrior. We don't know what to do with that. We don't have a ritual for that. But we do have a ritual for that. I'm proving it with the organic farm. But to show you how far we have fucked them up, 
with our stupid television shit and our goddamn rap shit and all this other crap. I said, write me something I love. And every one of those guys have somebody they love. And it's their bitch. And they love that. They would kill for her. How many of you, how many of you that are married would have your wife kill for you? How many of the men would kill for you? I mean, none! I've seen it a million times. Your spouses will not kill for you. Because we have this thing called reason. You know, a guy comes in the house, I'm not going to take a bullet. If he shoots her, I'm going to be sad. But hey, you know, I'm not going to stand in the way, you know? I mean, I'm not. You see it every single day. And real love is when you know you see this old couple in their age and you know that he would have given his life for her. That's real. You didn't see it right away. But I told these guys, what about love? And then I told them, I hate to tell you this, these are all guys that can beat me up and twist me in a thousand pieces of rape. And they all said that I said, well, look, you know that half of you are going to get raped. And they said to me, watch your mouth. I said, I'm sorry, but I got to tell you, I'm sorry. And all the guards were on the walls, and they were big, and they were like, dude, Jimmy, watch out, man. I mean, you've been coming here for years, but don't talk that way. Like, i got to tell these kids, man, you're going to get raped. And they're like, oh, they kill before I get raped. And then they were telling me, just shut up, just shut up. And I was like, I can't. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to write a letter. And they said, we ain't writing no letters. I said, fine. Then I want you to think about this. Just think about this. You love your girlfriends? They were like, yeah. We're gonna, she's going to stay true to us. And I said, well, can you tell me what that was like? And they were like, nah, the bitch, she gave it up, but fuck her when I wanted to. That's my bitch. All right? Could you explain how that happened? What did you do? No, nah, if I want to fuck her on a little car, I'd do it right there. I'm like, fuck, she's my bitch. I love her. And I'd die for her. I'd let somebody shoot me before I let them touch her. And what they were explaining to I was telling them, what you're describing for me is what they do to you in prison. You're raping her. And that was it. The guys start kicking the shit, saying, no, you better shut the fuck up, man. I said, dude, you're raping her, man. But you know, that's love for you. You don't know that you're doing that. You don't know it. And the guy, there was a chicken on the back who was going up for three lifetimes to San Quentin for a drive-by. And he looked at me, and I'll never forget him, and the guy was huge. And not just, he was like, he could come here to ASU and become an international NFL star. He was just a monster of a man. He looked at me, and he said, and I could see his eyes, all of a sudden I could see him holding back the tears, and he gets up, and, he, and the guards are back here, and there's some guards there, there, back here, there's a few of this three over here, and the bathrooms are over here. And he gets up on one there, and he goes in there, and the guards are here, Hey, let me just get And he's like, pew, awesome guy. And all you can hear is, bam! You hear a, he knocked the freaking wall down. And then the guard called the alarm. They pulled out their mason club. I ran from where I was speaking. I standing right there in the back. And I said, let me just get some pants, okay? And it made me want to cry. But I grabbed him, and he looked at me, and he said, I loved her. I didn't want to rape her. He said, but that's what they taught me. That's what I learned. That's how you express love. I didn't want to rape her. And I was like, ah. that's what we teach them. This whole university, how beautiful that campus is. My God, we're not going to say, well, I have, I have three kids left that are still going to go to university. One's going to go to Stanford. One's going to go to Berkeley or Santa Barbara. But I don't know where the third one. I was like, what beautiful campus this is, right? But do you teach kids here how not to rape women? Because this whole culture is about taking what you want if you got the money. And these kids learned it. Oh my God. And when the minister of opinion says, I never wanted to rape her. I was like, wow. And there was nothing you could do to man that heart. That heart was broken. When he realized that he had been raping the one woman that adored him. back in the seat. And the exercise I gave everybody was, I want you to write a letter apologizing for the way you learned how to love. And they all did. 
And it was amazing. They all wrote the letter. And it was the quietest workshop I ever did in my life. And even the guards had to leave the room because they were crying. The guards left the room. So many big, huge guys. Just, I, knew, I knew that they were ready to their lives. I knew it. But Stanford came to my house one day and offered me a ton of money for my letters, which I was going to take to the lab for the dump. And the guy came up with a briefcase and said, you want to give it or there? I'm between the least left top and Ernest anyway. And then I don't need to <laughs> They took all the stuff out of the truck and they left. And the guy said to me, what's this? And it was an envelope with change in it and a couple of crumpled dollar bills. And a little small letter. And it was from one of those kids in that workshop. And he says, he says, I remember what you said about the rape thing. He said, I did nine years. I came out I'm going to school now in community college. And I'll never forget what happened. And he said, I came home one day. My mom's a crackhead. When I came home, she tore the whole little apartment apart. She took the, the, the cabinets and ripped them off the wall, looking for crack. And she found your book, Immigrants in Our Land, which is right there. And when I walked into the apartment, she was sitting in a corner holding it, and she asked me to take her to the treatment center. Because of what you wrote about the, the whole thing, you know, with your parents and stuff like that. And all that. So, anyway, so, so he says, I, I'm working at McDonald's, and I'm working at another job at the train station, and I know you always don't make much money, or else you wouldn't be visiting people like me. They equate that, you know? I mean, okay, so you're a poet, you come to university, oh, you must be making it. But real poets don't go down into the fields of work with field workers and teach them how to read and write. Real poets don't go to county jails. They teach you that shit here in this country. Right? And in every other country in the world, real poets, that's all they do. But not here. You're only legitimized as a poet if you come here. Right? Well, anyway, that's a whole other discussion. Um, he sent me the money that he had earned that night and said, this is all I can afford. This is all I can give you. For helping my mom and uh, I came this close to going to spend that money on the pack circuits and I said I couldn't just not the for it that way so I left the money in there so at the Stanford archives if any of you go on to graduate you just uh, graduate there you'll find that envelope with this little kid in one thing with that little note saying this is all I can give you to say thank you for helping me that cool? I mean, that's you know, education is it's, it's so it's so confined to a bullshit bracket that it has nothing to do with the community here. I mean, I've been to the barrios here in Tucson. Where are you? There's nobody out there. Nobody. This is the this is the palace on the hill. That's right. You know what I'm saying? I go to, I go to the, I go to the communities. I don't see doctoral students out there. I don't see them. I don't see people, I don't see the graduate students in, in, in literature knocking on doors to teach the little Chicano kids like the way I was to teach to read English. You know, and there's a joke and it's true. What's the fastest thing in the body? A white kid on a bike. Vice <laughs> <laughs> versa, what's the rarest thing in a rich white neighborhood? A Chicano. Because as soon as they spawn, they pick him up. Boom. He's like an extinct species. There's one in the corner grabbing Joe. Boom, he's gone, right? I mean, this whole thing is, and you know, it, it's just not us in this room. It's an epidemic in America. We have an epidemic racial problem Amen. in America. And it's just not us. And we're trying to figure out what to do. I have answers for you. And all over the country, people are doing what I'm asking them to do. I mean, they thought I was an idiot for starting the organic farm, and I was one of the most successful. I got people lined up here all the way up everywhere. Delancey Street? I pay more, I pay more to my people in Delancey Street and I let these people go home and pay the rent, take care of the babies. I don't keep them in a dormitory style thing the way Delancey does. And we're starting our own cafe. But unlike Delancey, we're doing an indigenous meeting. Can you dig it? From Incas and Mexicas and stuff like You know, we're doing the indigenous. We're getting our seeds from the Zapatistas. And it's just like no revolution. This is just called trying to live a decent life. Have healthy food on the table, you know? Isn't that cool? I didn't learn that at the university. I just said, Dad, this tastes shitty, man. I want some good food, you know? You don't have to be rich to get good food. You just gotta support 
people like me <laughs> by buying my books and let me do the damn work I gotta do, right? It's amazing, I'm famous, I don't even wanna be famous. I, 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 I score in TV, I score in the print, I score in the air, I score in I, all of it. And I purposely, when I go on the radio station, I'll start cussing. A bunch of assholes out there listening to me, I'll say, like, I'll like, what? Right? I'll say it on purpose because I want to alienate you from that. Unless you have the time to get into my life and find out who I really am, I'm not for the soundbite. I'm not for the Oprah show. She came twice to Oakland. And do you realize that she would not take the kids and put them on film? I said, the real, it's not about me, it's about them. <coughs> Learning how to read and write, you ought to talk to them. I don't know, we're talking about you and this sensational book and how it's gone global, oh, my God. I said, no, that's not about me, it's about them. And can you believe that? And she said, no, I'm not. And I was like, thank you, God. Because when she had that show on the immigrants, I know none of you noticed this because it was so lovely. And I know other things about it too, being in the Hollywood thing, I'm not even going to tell you about that. But, yeah, well, you wouldn't believe what they did on her birthday. I'm not even go there, it's worse than, you want a porno? Go to her birthday party. But, that's the thing. <laughs> Listen, on the immigrant show, I, I just happened to watch by and look at it. Just happened to pass by and look at it. One of my friends looked at him. You know that when she was lauding, America's immigrants? Do you think it was a glaring omission not to have a Mexican family there? She had people from Bulgaria and Yugoslavia, England. And I said, well, she's got to come to the Mexican family sooner or later. There's like five million in Chicago. Not one Mexican family on the immigration show. And that's some. But she'd go to her house and just after seeing being gardeners and cooks. But not on that show. Now, why do you all think you demonize us so much? What is wrong with us that you would scapegoat us as the evilest scourge of the land? What is wrong with me? Why would you do that? What is wrong with me and my children that you demonize us as aliens? Why would you do that to me? My own children. My daughter asked me at the airport, why are they calling us aliens, Bucky? somebody that very, very hard to offer solutions. You have to come out and you have to work with us. 
and she see how we work with the gifts. Um, and then you have to have people like Jenny, and you have to have people like Javier. He's way in the corner over there, but he's the one that connected Cammy, Cammy connected me to him. And it's really about, about people in his position, and there's nobody that I absolutely adore more than Javier, because for him to do this on a three-day notice is amazing, right? And Cammy tried to put this together for me to come, and that's amazing. So it's really about getting to know the people in your, in your community, because the people in your own community have the resources to do it, and that's called people resources. I swear to God, it's people, not money, not influence, not power, not politics. It's just people. This buckle here, who? Cammy, Cammy knew me, and there's more and more of us who know each other. I mean, look at what they did. These are two college kids, and they put together a best-selling. And they did it, they didn't have a single penny. And when you see the end of that movie, you're going to have to walk out. Because the credits, you have 10,000 people who donated a dollar. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I was like, are you kidding me? Even my daughter, my 8-year-old daughter, my 10-year-old son, my 12-year-old daughter, they're all up there. I mean, people are like, oh, I can't believe all these people. They just keep going, they'll tell you names, row after row. What an enormous community effort and achievement that was for them. I mean, I am so proud to be part of this because of all the people. And the community farm, people. The Cedar Tree Poetics, the, the company I have, the, the people. Uh, the, the film director at UNM just, just jumped online, said, I wanna, I wanna go ahead and edit your online classes for 2,400 2, units. And this, this woman, bless her soul, from the detention center, said, I took four years of computer science and graduated and worked with a professor. I want to come in and do the blackboard for you. I mean, these are saints walking around. I, and they're like, so what we're trying to do is, is sneak in through the back door in education. And what we're trying to do is, 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 is show what works. And show how you get the kids who do not want to learn to love learning. And we have it on tape now, and we've done it. We did it. We spent $140,000 filming. And we did it in Monterey Bay, Santa Fe, Texas, Oklahoma, and, and Gallup, New Mexico. And we show you on tape what it takes to take a student. By the end of the online class, an hour later, that student is no longer the same person. We show you on film with lesson comes. Once we did that, we had all these other people. The, the director of the film department said, I want to edit. And she's a woman who's worked with film before. And I was like, only God could send somebody like that to me, you know? And this other woman who said, I took computer science and worked in the department. I want to come in and do the blackboards and promise. I don't even know what she's talking about. I'm like, thank you very much, you know. So it works and it goes on and it's like amazing. Next week in DC at the Gaylord Hotel, we have over 8,000 teachers coming to see that. Is that amazing? And then when they found out that I was going to come, which I wasn't, the international president of Scholastic was going to fly in on his jet. And guess what? All of a sudden, this country CEO Louis Briggs. She's coming in to sit next to me. All of a sudden, one of my best friends from Atlanta, Georgia, or Leia, called me up and she says, dude, do you realize the opportunity you have for that to go global? No, not this, the online classes, right? They want to they take this too, but, but we're talking 250,000 units, packages of four online classes at $100 a pop. That's 24 million. Now, thank God I'm over my drug addiction because that would be one long party. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would call up everybody for that. Hey, Simon's gay, I got two million got that. This party. Thank God that shit's over, right? <laughs> so, and all, and if that dream were to come true, if that dream were to come true, you're going to see educational satellites set up all over for you, for, for, for him. 
Miami. I mean, we're going to use them and we're going to spread it out across the country. And you don't have to fill out this much paperwork. We're just going to write you a check. Here, here's 100000 Go to the Bay Area and do it. Because I know the people that are doing it now. The only thing they complain about is they don't have the money. I know the people in the Bronx. I know people in Chicago, New Orleans, Detroit. I know the Rastas in Detroit, Eddie. They've been, their whole lives been dedicated to teaching the kids, but they're fighting an uphill thing. They're trying, to, they're trying to run up a mountain that's iced over. And it's so sad to see these black brothers, man, that are working so hard. And these sisters, and all they do is when you come up, they cry, man, Jimmy, Jimmy, you want to be with you. It's not good, brother. And all they need is money that those assholes have. The cold brothers. And, hmm. and uh, you know, oh my God. That hotel, I love it. Thank you, Kenny. But man, what I could do with the money that I spent on that thing. Yeah. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Hey, I'm not a doctor. I'm about to go to the sauna. Jimmy, we got questions. We got time for one more question. Sorry, look, I'm just so into this people power. We can do it. It's just all of us, man. First of all, we thank you from on behalf of all of us for being here. And a bigger thank you for taking what you've learned and sharing it. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, it seems to me, I, I agree with you with the empowerment model of education instead of the factual model of education. But what do we do about the family unit where the child is only, you know, whether he's 18 or he's 8, the child is only in school for what, six, seven hours. The rest of the time, their environment is um, violent, is not supportive of the school system, what do we do about the parents? Because for me, if they are getting supported in their education, in their access, in their empowerment, from their roots, then you've got change. So what do we do about the parents? Well, I don't like words like empowerment. I don't like a lot of words like that. I don't like words, I don't like words that have lost their meaning except in the uh, monetary world where we speak about words, we use words to discuss what is best fitting for the capitalistic economy. We, we, we take it in that kind of language over to love and to you know, all this stuff. I'd like to do this. I just like to mentor. You know, if I tell a kid don't do drugs, I don't know. He's not going to see me doing drugs. And, 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 and I'm going to break through this glass facade uh, of what they've been told and taught in this artificial environment that's not competitive, that's so competitive and not compassionate, not even sacred space. When people are doing stuff, it's supposed to be in a sacred way. We're supposed to honor and trust what other people say in that space. In today's educational setting, it's anything but sacred. But that beside the point, uh, what I'd like to do with the next conduct is ensure him and her that I'll pay you a weekly check and I expect you to take it home and pay the rent. I expect you to take it home, buy the kids some diapers. I expect you to do that. And on Sunday, you know what? Whoever invented a library, which is supposed to be the center of our community, and use it as something that chases people away. Why can't we have a, a cook in the library that does the models? Why can't we can't have poetry readings upstairs and, as a general practice every day? Why can't we have a film department at the library? Why can't the library become a community center, a boys club with books. Why can't the library become the place where all mothers who are bored bring their kids and let them run? Let the kids run up and down. Who said? Let's get all the homeless people in there and let's have like a massive shower room in the back. And then everybody wash the homeless, let them wash their asses. That will humble these people. Get the people who are doing community work. The rich ones who are uh, driving their big fast Mercedes Benz and getting tickets, let them go wash the asses of the homeless in the library. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That would be such a cool community project, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, let's mix this up, right? <laughs> let's use the library as a sacred center of the community and not some place that closes at five. Okay? Let's give away the violence on Saturday afternoon. Everybody comes to have these massive cook-offs. Right? Let's just get 
get the library as a community resource and use it the way that we're supposed to use it. That is something that is so exclusive for only those who come and read. Let's use it for everything. Let's have the parking lots packed. Let's go to the library and have giveaways. Let, let's invite everybody to come on and get all the books they want. Let's get everybody in AA since that's a big, oh, I got a better thing. How about we get all the yoga ladies? <laughs> all these women who are like doing the yoga stuff, you know, it's become like this La Barbie Yogi. You know, like, the new Barbie doll. But then again, America, look at me, I'm, I'm the new Barbie Yoga or whatever, right? Let's get all those Barbie people into the library. And let's, let's let them start working with these 80 year old Chicanas. All right, let's do this. Whoa, whoa. Let's, get, let's use the library like that. Instead, oh, I gotta pay 85 bucks a week to go in there and go, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> get in and do it with the people whose bones hurt. They who haven't had the luxury of having nutritious food and meals, they don't have the money. How about that? How about we go to all the health food centers and say, how about you start taking food in the library and let these old yellows men who work their goddamn life on the railroad taste green algae drink? You know, for the first time in their life, fuck, it's why I'm in Santo Luis with the food on my own. Oh, that's very good. Where'd you get that? Let's start sharing. And we get to know each other. You know what I'm saying? That's just one little tiny suggestion in the last three minutes. Thank you. I love you all. I'll sign books. Come in. The prices are on the cover. I will sign them for you. 